Going from product to venture is really, really tough because in product or in any type of operations, every single day you are getting feedback. In venture, there can be a lot of false signals, there can be a lot of unknowns, and it's really hard to know. There's not a lot of venture money going to women founders or founders of color. I think I'm extra conscious of supporting them and helping them. We believe that the brand and the emotional connection that a company, a product, a service has with the consumer is paramount. Hello, and welcome to Venture Confidential, a series of conversations with top minds in venture capital. I'm your host, Peter Chapman. Venture Confidential is brought to you by Heavybit, a program for developer-facing startups. If you're interested in learning more about the Heavybit program or being a guest on this podcast, email me at vc at heavybit.com. Anarya, thank you so much for joining us on Venture Confidential. Yeah, thanks for having me. I know you studied science, technology, and society at Stanford, spent some time at Google, worked at a bunch of startups, Mm -hmm. and then made the leap to venture in 2014. Correct. Tell me about that move. Yeah. So, you know, after Stanford went to Google, was on the operating side, was on the product AdWords Express, Google's local ads product, learned a ton there and was the perfect cradle to an introduction to the corporate world. Um, Google's fantastic, great culture, great leaders, worked with engineers who could make computers do backflips. Like it was amazing. Um, And left there after three years because I felt like there was something out there where I could grow much, much, much faster and hustle at a pace that I um, had yet to reach. And I felt like there was a potential and young and this is the time to do it type of attitude. Uh And knew a lot of friends in the startup world and jumped to a fintech startup, um, rode a massive wave of up, 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 and then crash and burn and experienced a lot in a year at the startup. Um, A lot of what not to do and was not uncommon to spend the night at the office type of thing. Oof. Worked a lot, learned a lot, grew a lot, and don't regret that experience at all. So kind of went through a different startup thing and wanted to see what was next and was considering joining another startup, perhaps starting something myself, but didn't have an idea and was talking to a bunch of different friends, some of whom were in venture and asking them, what are ideas you're interested in, categories, companies in your portfolio I may want to join. And that's when one of my friends who had a small seed fund in San Francisco suggested that I come in, maybe help on the venture side with diligence, with product diligence specifically, and help some of the portfolio companies and see if I wanted to join one or start something. Cool. Yeah. Tell me about those early years. What was it like being a a new venture associate? Oh, man. You know, I have. So now it is what? Spring of 2017. So I've been in in the world of venture for for three years. Wow. It does not feel like that long. I think going from product to venture is really, really tough because in product or in any type of operations, every single day you are getting feedback like you solved this bug, you launched this feature, this customer said this, whatever, whatever. There is a feedback cycle and every day you have metrics that tell you whether you're good at your job or bad at your job and Mm. you can work towards getting better. In venture, there can be a lot of false signals, there can be a lot of unknowns and it's really hard to know. You make an investment and you do your best and you help as much as you can and let's see what happens. <laughs> and I think you and I have both seen examples of companies that look amazing and then they kind of crash and burn and vice versa. Companies that look like they have no promise and have trouble raising and then suddenly they blossom into something quite incredible. So that was the initial hardest thing for me was every day I was like, am I doing the right thing? And I'm a pretty data driven person. So I would track everything in Google Docs and look at companies that I'd seen, track strictly VC and pitch book and see if any of them had looked a little bit successful or had inklings of success just to see, give myself a gut check. Mm. Um, Had some interesting things, uh, companies that I had really wanted to invest in and we ended up passing that had nice exits and acquisitions. And I was like, okay, there's a little bit of a shimmer of I'm doing something right. Okay. Um, but, but we'll see. I'm still super new and super young adventure in the grand scheme of things. So do you still track the performance of companies you've passed on? Yes, we do that as a firm. So I'm at Mavron now, consumer only venture capital firm. And every week we look at a competitive report where we see the consumer investments that got announced that week. Mm-hmm. And we look at ones that we saw and and kind of look at ones that we saw and passed. Why did we pass? Or ones that we didn't see. Why did we not see them? 
How do we think about that investment, et cetera, et cetera. So we're very much focused on making sure we're, we are being as data driven as, as we can. Cool. Yeah. How are you actually measuring intermediate success? Is it just funding rounds or are you looking at other indicators? You know, funding rounds at the end of the day, they're marks on paper. So it's hard to know for sure. Um, it is an indicator of something. So we can certainly look at that and say, OK, this is generally trending in a positive way. Um, as much as possible, we try to stay very close to other investors and founders and try to get any type of metrics around um, companies. And obviously, we know know our own and know how companies are trending internally. Um, and I think that looking at the market and looking at consumer appetite, the nice thing about investing in consumers, you see the product or the service out and about, you see people using it or not using it, and you can kind of get a macro level pulse of, of what's going on. And that's another indicator. I think at the end of the day, there's no easy answer to know if something's working, but part of our job is to keep tabs on the market and to see what cultural consumer tech trends are. What brands are consumers latching on to? What do they love? What do they hate? Are we invested in those areas? And how do we find companies in those areas? You, you said to, it's hard to get feedback. You know, one thing that I experienced early in venture is that when you're working for a large company, there's often a really systematized sort of career progression and feedback channels. And maybe you're getting quarterly performance reviews, peer reviews. There's less of that in venture. How did you figure out how to sort of guide your own career development in this field? At Maveron, I am lucky and blessed enough to work with a very small team. So our investment team is four general partners in me. Mm. And two of the general partners are here in San Francisco and two are up in Seattle. And I have a really perfect blend, I think, of autonomy as well as mentorship. And they take the apprenticeship model very seriously. So before joining Mavron, that's something that I really dug into because I saw how hard venture can be. And if you're kind of floundering around as a junior person in venture, unsure of what you're doing, it's really hard to build a career and to develop and to get better. And I think many of us, our goal is to get better, whatever we do, whether that's work or dance or cooking or relationships, whatnot. And the benefit of working with people who have seen this uh, is that you kind of tangentially as well as directly benefit from their pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful that my partners are very open about telling me about opportunities they missed. And they're not going to dwell on it, but they will say, you know, why they passed and why they might have felt that reason to pass and what the metrics might have sent then or said then and what the metrics say now type of thing. So I learn a lot from them mm -hmm. and I use that as a way to to gauge my own growth in venture. And our team is really, really close. Being small helps with that. And we do our Monday meetings face to face every Monday. And because of that, we have a lot of transparency and honesty and an openness that allows us to give each other feedback. And the feedback could be anything from, hey, we were in this pitch meeting together and you asked this question and I thought you were going to ask this follow up question, but you didn't. Is that something you thought about? And I'm like, oh, good. I didn't think about that. Now I know. Huh. Um to, hey, give me your feedback on this company and I provide the feedback. And they're like, okay, that was good assessment or bad assessment. And here's what you missed. Here's what you got right. So a huge part of that is the function of the team. Yeah. Awesome. Any themes that have emerged for you, stuff that you really want to get better at over the next couple of years? Everything. Everything. <laughs> um, everything. I mean, you know, in, in venture, you have to find companies you have to win the deal. You have to help the company. You have to know when to exit. Mm. The timing is critical. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to either maintain your ownership or the dynamics of that because exiting when you own very little may not be a smart thing or whatever. Timing is key. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to be good at fundraising at the end of the day because as a VC, you're also getting funding from other LPs. So I think all five of those things I'm continually attempting to get better at. What I love about the job is that it affords me the ability to just be curious. And I feel really lucky that uh, it's my job to be curious, to ask questions, to meet people, to ask them more questions, to dig and learn and read. It's amazing. And um, I think that curiosity is something that has been with me kind of my whole life. And it's awesome to be able to have a professional career where that curiosity is rewarded. And I think with venture now the training and the coaching is around like targeted curiosity. Like where am I digging? Where am I trying to find 
the, what, what am I trying to unearth? What questions am I really asking? And am I asking them in a way that I'm like understanding the motivations of the founder, how they may react in certain situations? I mean, it's such a people-based business, especially in the early stage. Like we invest in the seed and series A stage and you're betting on people. Yeah. The business will go up a roller coaster, go down this way and that way, but you want to bet on the right people and getting to know the people is a whole different level of curiosity that I think I'm just learning how to express. Yeah, I, I love this phrase, targeted curiosity. You know, uh, <laughs> I just came up with it. <laughs> point it. It's yours. Um, Thank you. I think one of the one of the early challenges for me when I got into this was venture is so broad. You know, it feel it felt like at any stage there were hundreds of possible companies that I could be researching, talking to. Um, and even with those companies, the range of possible questions and investigations seemed really overwhelming. Oh yeah. What's some stuff you figured out in narrowing that range? Well for us, we have the high level kind of umbrella of we only invest in consumer tech brands. And we believe that the brand and the emotional connection that a company, a product, a service has with the consumer is paramount. And people will use products and services and bring them into their lives because they fall in love with something about it. There's some emotional connection. It makes them feel nostalgia. It makes them feel happy. It makes them feel successful, whatever it may be. And our entire kind of thesis is around that. And so that brings it to one category. And of course, that's huge and broad. Mm -hmm. You know, within consumer, we invest in fintech, health tech, social apps, e-commerce, frontier tech, kind of everything under the sun that's direct to consumer and leveraging tech. And then the next layer we add on that is that we're very team and founder driven. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people talk about like product market fit. One thing we talk about is product founder fit. Hmm. What makes this person or this team the right person or team to build X? Is it a problem they had that they're trying to solve? Is it a field they worked in and they have kind of this intimate knowledge that allows them to innovate? Or it may even be that they have nothing to do with this field. So they have this fresh outsider's perspective and then they can come in and make it better for everybody. And so really figuring out like, who are you founder and what are you building? Why are you building this and building a relationship with them? and having faith in them, not the, you know, of course we're looking at the product, the market, the business opportunity and everything, but first and foremost, it's the, the person. Can you give me an example of good product team fit that you've seen? Yeah, so we led the Series A in a company called Allbirds, which is a vertically integrated woolen shoe company right now. And they make this, uh, they have two products right now. They have a sneaker and they have a lounger and they're made of merino wool, and they are environmentally friendly, sustainably designed shoes. And they're amazing. They're super light, the most comfortable shoe you'll ever wear. And the founding team um, of Joey and Tim, super interesting team. So Joey um, has a background in material science and business. And Tim, it was a professional soccer player. He was on the uh, New Zealand national soccer team, played in a World Cup, had this huge soccer career. And so I think the pairing of those two is quite interesting when you're thinking about building this lifestyle brand, building sneakers, building shoes, is you have someone who was an athlete who lived in sneakers and shoes and all that stuff. And then you have this other person who has a scientific background in material science and pair them together and voila, all birds. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You know, I took a look at the Mavron values before this meeting. Okay. And a lot of what you were talking about and the Mavron team seems to be echoed in the values you look for in founders. You talked about being receptive to feedback, being curious. Is there a relationship here? Like, is the stuff that you seek in each other the same stuff that you're looking for in founders? I would say our values and what we believe in at Mavron touches every single point of Mavron. It is in the core and something that the GPs live day to day. It's something that the whole team, myself, the operational team, we all kind of live and breathe by. And it's something certainly that our extended family, our portfolio, friends of the firm, all of those folks, I think, are very connected to that. And a large part of it is putting the consumer at the center. What does the consumer want and how do we deliver it to them? And then it's building these businesses around that and leveraging technology to make it easier to learn, get it to the consumer faster, give them an optimal experience. But it's not that this one cool technology is going to change my life. 
And we don't think consumers live like that. Consumers don't say, you know, it's fascinating that there is this rotating machine system that gets me from point A to point B. They say, I call my Uber or I call my Lyft and it's awesome. And that is kind of connected to all of us. And I think the values of honesty, transparency, curiosity, hard work and hustle, that is 100% emulated by the team. And I think it naturally becomes what we look for in our founders oftentimes. How do you test for that in a founding team? So on average, before we do a Series A investment, we've known that founder for a year and a half. So again, Mm. we're very relationship driven and our seed strategy is a way, our seed, our, our seed investment is a way to get to know founders early, founders and team early. Mm-hmm. And that allows us to build a relationship over time. And we have numerous touch points, whether it is one-on-one coffees or inviting them to events or spending time at their office and also meeting other people that they know. And so through a combination of that, we're really able to get to know them and how they operate, how they hire, how they inspire, how they navigate really tough situations, how they think about capital and its usage, et cetera, et cetera. Because at the end of the day, as a CEO, you have a bajillion things to do. And yeah, it's hard to test for every single thing. And of course, there's going to be surprises, especially when things go downhill. You see how someone reacts under pressure. And that's not something you can always test for. You can, of course, reference them and do all that stuff. But sometimes you just don't know until you know. And that's kind of the risk and beauty of venture. (laughs) So uh, you had this lovely framework earlier. You said there's sort of five components to venture, finding the right companies, winning the deal, helping those companies, getting the timing right, and raising your own fund. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to go back to the first step, sourcing. You said that you often start a relationship at a series seed. Yep. How do you find those companies? Sourcing, the eternal art and science and mystery that I think we're all trying to get better (laughs) at. (laughs) Please, tell me, yeah. Um, Multiple different avenues. I think one part is meeting lots of people. So we work very closely with other seed firms um, because in the seed stage, we're not competitive. We're not leading rounds. We're just a part of it. And we can easily and nicely come in and be that puzzle piece to fill out the round. Mm -hmm. Or we can be the first check in and help fill out the round with other friends and venture. So it's a, it's a nice, easy way for us to get involved. And so we spend a lot of time talking to building relationships with other seed funds and seed firms and kind of see what's going on there. We obviously respect our existing portfolio founders a lot and get interesting sourcing opportunities from them. They'll be like, Hey, have you seen this company or this idea? Or have you met this person? And that's always super valuable. We love those uh, recommendations. And again, those recommendations may come from our portfolio CEOs. They may come from friends of the firm. They may come from other investors, whatever. Mm -hmm. Another area, I think all of us on the team have nicely overlapped networks, but also differentiated networks, whether that's from school, previous jobs, just living and being in the Valley or in Seattle or New York or whatever. And so kind of leveraging those networks to see what's going on. One thing I love about consumer investing is that you're investing in products and services that are touching regular people. Yeah. And because of that, you just, you never know where a really cool opportunity could come from. You may see it at the farmer's market. You may read about it in Glamour magazine. You may hear about it from someone sitting next to you on an airplane. So I think we're always ears up, eyes open, seeing what's going on and kind of academically and rigorously spending time understanding consumer trends. Mm. But also it's something that we all love and care about. So we do it all the time. (laughs) Uh, is, Is there a set of trends that you're tracking closely right now? I think everyone on the team is looking at a bunch of different things. I think like high level trends, uh, I'll give you, I mean, there's, there's so many, I'll give you an example of a couple of things. Um, one, you know, we're seeing consumers taking a more and more interest in ownership in their healthcare. Mm. The way in which millennials or Gen Z manages their health is very different from how our parents' generation may manage their health. I may go immediately to Google to diagnose versus calling a doctor or going to the doctor. And so there's just a change in the way people think about it, a change in the way they own it. And there is kind of this 
perhaps disconnect from the traditional go to the hospital, go to the doctor. And there's many other ways in which you can do it. So I think that's a high level trend we're looking at and seeing a lot of interesting companies and apps and services kind of around that. Everything from different types of insurance to a different clinical model to do it at home kits and even things like the quantified self with wearables and stuff that can match, that can track people's different health metrics. Do you have sort of a formal division of expert domains within the firm? Do you say like, I'm the healthcare guru Uh, or do you sort of everyone does everything? Yeah. Uh, The benefit of the team being small is that we're very collaborative Mm -hmm. and almost on everything, we're kind of like a two person process. So we'll have like a main and then a plus one. And because of that, um, you know, we get exposure to a lot of different sectors and I'm able to partner with multiple different GPs on different projects and different investment opportunities. There's a little bit of like David on, our, on my team, exam- for example, is kind of our hardware person and looks at all the hardware opportunities. Um, but again, other people have plus one him on different deals. So it's pretty flexible. Cool. Yeah. I know in a, at a previous role, you started a VR accelerator. Are you still playing in that space at all? Yes, I did help start a VR accelerator. And yes, I'm also looking at kind of the category of consumer frontier tech. So looking to see what are the next things around the corner that will work their ways into consumers' lives. Is that VR, AR? Is that automation? Is that voice-based chat systems? Is it personal assistance? Whatever. And I think it's a fascinating space. And it's super exciting to think about like, how will people interact with the world around them in the next two years, three years, five years, 10 years. And um, certainly looking at that space, we've made a couple investments. We announced a series A investment in a Seattle based VR AR company called Pluto. And yeah, we have, a, we have a bunch of different investments in the area. I'm deeply curious, like what will this world look like in 10 years? Where do you think we're skating towards? I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier, which is like technology is continuing to accelerate and to advance. I don't think it's going to be like a aha moment where you suddenly wake up and you're like, wow, everything is robotics and automated around me. I think it's kind of things that seem fringe that slowly inch their way into our lives. And it is things that go from obscurity to a little bit of usage to ubiquity. And I think that the companies and products and services that will win are ones that aren't like completely changed the way you live your life in order to use this. They'll just gradually work their way in. Someone told me this cool term, which is called Maya, dot. So Maya stands for most advanced yet acceptable. And I think that applies to technologies because we're going to see things that are really, really on the edge of like, wow, is this possible? But it is still accepted and kind of works its way into society. So that may not be a completely humanoid robot that is walking on the sidewalk, but it may be a car that drives itself, mm. which is still automated and technically robotic. But it's way, it's looking for those little psychological places that you can jump into that is still acceptable to people and that is something that people will still integrate into their lives. What are some other Maya technologies right now? So I have two Google Homes and an Echo. That's a lot. It's a lot, especially when you consider I live in San Francisco and probably don't have that much space. (laughs) But I think it is astounding and amazing that you can shout into the ether and the ether responds. And I had a friend's kid who I saw was pinching their fingers on a paper magazine, wondering why it wasn't expanding. (laughs) And I hear stories of kids who will walk into rooms and will say, hey, Alexa, play Sesame Street. Mm. And the kid may not know that Alexa is this black coned device. They may think that you can scream into the ether and things happen. That's amazing. (laughs) I love this because it just it feels like an ancient human dream. Yeah. Yeah. That like there's something out there. Like you're commanding to us. the gods yeah. to play your favorite song. <laughs> yeah. That's the future we live in. Yeah. 
And, and I mean, I, I'm so connected to these like home systems that I'll find myself being in a hotel or something and I'll say, Hey Google, what's the weather? And nobody responds. And I'm like, Oh, well that's disappointing. <laughs> yeah. I want to move to, to part two of Anargia's venture framework. Okay. Winning the deal. Ah, okay. So you've been, you've been doing this for a while now. And I imagine that your approach to negotiating has changed somewhat in, mm-hmm. in the three years. What are some things that you do now that you didn't do three years ago when it comes to actually closing capital? There are tons of great funds out there and mm-hmm. there's tons of great investors. And I think I've learned more and more that as a firm and as an individual investor, you know, we invest in brands. It's also all about our own brand, the Maveron brand, the Anargia brand, the brand of all the other partners I work with, and really establishing that so that founders and teams know what they get when they sign up for a long-term relationship with us. And establishing that brand, just like any company would do, takes time and you do multiple different things. And for me, joining Maveron was because of the Maveron brand. Maveron has established itself over the last almost two decades invested in companies like early eBay and Groupon and Shutterfly and recently things like Everlane and Allbirds and Periscope and seeing a company that has been unapologetically consumer, Mm. especially when many other firms are like, oh, we're not going to touch consumer or we're going to do a little bit of enterprise. But for me, it was like really important to work on products and services that were affecting people's lives every day that were in the hands of people. And I think Mavron did a great job establishing that brand and that attracted me to the firm. And I think that attracts founders and other people to the firm. And when you're working on building a consumer tech brand and you want the secret sauces of what works, what doesn't work, how to craft your story, how to figure out what that emotional connection is, because it could be multiple things. You know, our our hope and what we see happen is that the founder wants to partner with us because we've been through that and seen that pattern recognition, not me personally, but the firm and the other partners. And I think what I've learned in terms of being able to be that partner of choice for the founder is, again, it comes down to that relationship. And what value can we add? Do we show that we are a founder friendly and we're supportive and we're going to be on their side even when things are hard, Mm. that we're going to open up our own Rolodex and help them hire, help them bring in other investors for later rounds, help them with PR, whatever it is, and showing that early on. I personally have always believed and my parents raised me like this, which is to throw good things into the universe and good things may come back one day. And maybe that's being raised Hindu and having kind of this belief of karma. But I think part of it really clicks with how Mavron works, which is, yeah, we're going to help founders Mm -hmm. and we may not be investing in them today. We may not be investing in them tomorrow, but hopefully when the time is right, we've done good things and earned that goodwill to be able to lead the round or they're hopefully recommending us to other founders who are also fundraising. And of course, you have to give founder friendly term sheets and terms and and all of those things. And I think what also I've seen happen over the last uh, year and a half that I've been at Mavron is we will refer a founder where we're trying to win a deal to other founders in our portfolio. And Mm. and hopefully they have great things to say. Hmm. So you said you you do seed investments really as a way to build pipeline for your Series A investments. Um, How often do you do you get in on the Series A without having invested in the seed? I don't have the numbers to share off the top of my head, but there are certainly instances where we don't invest in the seed and invest in the A. Mm -hmm. There are instances where we do invest in the seed and invest in the A. And there's also instances where we do invest in the seed and don't invest in the A. So all of the combinations happen. I'm wondering, you know, when you invest in the seed, you have a long time to show that you can add value and build that relationship. Mm -hmm. A lot harder to demonstrate that when you're when you're meeting a company closer to the A and you're not in an earlier round. How do you charm them when you have sort of collapsed timeline? Yeah, good question. Take them to Hamilton. I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, Couple different things. So if we meet a company and and don't do the seed, the seed check is a very small check for us and oftentimes for the founder as well. So even when we don't do the seed, there are instances where we'll set up weekly, biweekly calls with the founder to still support them, to still add value. And we may recommend a great branding firm to them. We may help them hire their head of marketing. We may help them think about how big this round should be. There's there's multiple different ways that that we can add support. One thing I 
love about Mavron, about my team is that I feel like everybody is like unapologetically, very authentically themselves. Mm. And I feel like that allows us to form these relationships with founders that are very friendly and it's amazing to see when founders that you do or even don't invest in text you and ask you for advice or ask you a question. And I see that happen with me, but even more so with the GPs I work with. And that's awesome. When you're that 10 PM call and someone's like, Hey, I wanted to do a quick gut check with you. That's trust. And that's something that we really, really value and are honored to have. And I think that comes from interactions and from how we treat people. Uh, how we treat each other that shows and how we treat our founders, I think spreads from how we treat each other, treat each other. Sure. Yeah. One of the common complaints I hear from founders is that their interactions with folks in venture can be very difficult to parse. Ah, it's yeah. difficult to get blunt feedback, a lot of soft nose, sort of ambiguous next steps. It sounds like you're a fairly blunt team. I don't know if blunt has a negative or positive connotation <laughs> to it, but I would say we are straightforward, honest, and transparent. And at least we try our best, best, best to be. Of course, there's going to be emails and stuff that slip through the clock, uh, slip through the cracks and things like that. But, um, you know, when we're meeting founders, we want to quickly turn around and give them a yes or no. And, you know, no, it's okay to say no. And in our business, as you know, there's going to be a lot of no's. Sure. And I have a tremendous respect for founders because they're so used to hearing no, 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 no. I mean, I've heard Howard Schultz say the with Starbucks, how many no's he got until he got a yes. And that's an amazing company that has reached every corner of the earth. And as an investor, we really owe it to the founders when we say the no to do it in a timely manner and hopefully give them something helpful, whether that's a no, but maybe I can introduce you to this person is looking for a job in this field or whether it's a no, you're not a good fit for us because you're too B2B, but maybe I can introduce you to one of my friends who does B2B investing mm. or it's a no. And here's why I'm worried about this, this and this. And if they're not worried about it, that's fine. But maybe it's something they um, didn't realize was something that would be a red flag for investors and it helps them in their other pitches or in developing their business. So I found that there's easy no's and there's hard no's. And the easy no's for me are when it's like, hey, you're really outside our domain. Yeah. You're too late stage. Yeah. You're competitive with an existing company. There's nothing we can do about this. The hard no's tend to be more personal. Mm. Hey, you rubbed one of our partners the wrong way. Mm. Or, you know, the team is not sold on your vision. How do you deliver that more touchy feedback in a way that preserves the relationship? I mean, a lot of it boils down to the language and the tone. Mm. I think many times it is going to be that, you know, we think the idea is good and the market is there, but we're not sure if you have the right people around you to get there. Yeah. And saying like, I think there's something here and I think you can do it. It's just not the right time for us right now to see that it's going to happen in the next three months or whatever. Mm. Let's stay in touch. Can we help you? And let us know when you lock down that amazing head of acquisition or whatever it is that will fill the gaps. If it's a thing that, you know, you rubbed another partner the wrong way, that's hard feedback to give. And I don't, I honestly don't know if it is given every single time. I think at the end of the day, it's going to help the founder. You know, if, if it's something in the way they pitch or the way they respond to questions or the way they address people and it could be tweaked slightly and it could make their pitches 10 X better. And I need to practice what I preach. I think it's helpful if we tell them. And I think I do in many instances, but I'm sure I don't in some instances, it's hard to give personal feedback and you never know, like, is that something that they can change about themselves? I yeah. Don't know. So it makes this business hard. <laughs> One thing I think I am very, very conscious of is when I'm meeting women founders or underrepresented founders, founders of color, and I recognize that one, there's not a lot of venture money going to women founders or founders of color. And I think I'm extra conscious of supporting them and helping them. Mm. And in those instances, you know, I may give them a call later and say like, Hey, like, I think you're super smart. I think you're going to build something great. 
here are a few things in your pitch that you may not be aware of that could rub a VC in the wrong way or that may raise red flags. You know, I think many investors talk about helping women founders or helping underrepresented founders. And I think if you can put your ego on hold and say, you know what, I'm going to suck it up and get the courage to give them this honest feedback because I truly think it's going to help them. And I think it's going to help a bigger category of people then I think it's time to suck up the ego and give them that feedback. Yeah. Is there some common feedback that you deliver along those lines? I mean, it could be a number of things. It could be something like, hey, in the pitch, you know, you talked about wanting to get acquired next year Mm -hmm. because maybe you think that's what VCs want to hear. It's really helpful to do your research in advance and know what kind of VC you're pitching. And if it's a Series A investor with their fund size and stuff, they probably don't want you to get acquired in the next year for a small amount that's great for you, but not great for your investors. Mm -hmm. And it's just like knowledge that some people know because of their networks and because of other privileges that they're born with or that, that they have around them. And some people don't know. And if I'm able to share that insight and help them in their pitches, then I think it's my obligation to do so. Interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we're talking about diversity in tech. You know, one of the things that we struggle with is creating a portfolio that has uh, a rich representation of female founders, founders of color. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you're doing to get more of these underrepresented founders at Maveron? So one thing about Maveron that really attracted me there was that Rebecca Caden is a GP and she's a woman. Um, She's incredible. And she was one of my first touch points with Maveron and we really hit it off. She has immense passion for consumer tech brands, has a ton of pattern recognition and insight and is just a a really wonderful person who is a go-getter and has a lot of uh, heart and hustle. Mm. And I think when you're investing in companies that are targeting regular people, you need to make sure that you have a diverse mindset around your own table. Mm -hmm. And I think Maveron does a really good job with that. The best job, I think everyone can always improve. And I think we're very conscious of that. And I think we're always keeping our own mindsets and frameworks in check. Because one one thing that is important to remember is that Just because you wouldn't use a product doesn't mean that millions of other people wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I love about my team is that we're very conscious of that. We're always talking about that. We're aware of that. We have women on the team. We have people of color on the team. And we're able to recognize that the consumers that our portfolio companies are targeting are broad and diverse. And therefore, we too have to think in a broad, diverse manner. And that the founders who build these companies will also be broad and diverse. And so we look broadly and diversely. And I think all of us are constantly thinking about how do we see more companies that are led by women and led by underrepresented founders and how do we find them? And we continue to work hard at that. And it can come from a variety of things. It can come from mentorship, which all of us do. It can come from speaking at specific events. It can come from outreach Um, And it can come from throwing a lot of goodwill into the world and hoping it hits somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the little story you told about how if you if you talk to a founder who's a woman or a person of color, you're extra likely to reach out afterwards and offer them some helpful feedback. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in it because I I think it points to this uh, this thing that seems a little bit tricky to me, which you know, I used to call executive presence and it's sort of about like how one presents themselves Mm -hmm. in front of a board. One of the lines that I walk is on the one hand, I really encourage founders to be vulnerable with me. Mm -hmm. You know, we want them to be their true selves and we want them to sort of spill their guts and trust us. And we also want to know that they're going to pitch well. Mm -hmm. How do you walk this line of sort of encouraging people to Mm -hmm. be really vulnerable while also testing for their ability to, you know, handle themselves in front of an adverse bunch of investors. Part of it is as a founder, you should know the ins and outs of your business, right side up, upside down. If I'm mentoring a founder or helping them with their pitch, that's the first place to start, which is like, be yourself and be your authentic self. You don't want to go in there and be someone else because then the whole pitch is going to probably 
fall apart because you're spending so much time trying to be something else. Mm -hmm. But know your business really, really well. If that's not a strength, if knowing the numbers or if being able to tell a story in a clear way is not a strength, practice that Mm. and pitch it to friends, pitch it to other investors who maybe are not in your domain, but can still give you valuable feedback, practice in front of a mirror. And that's something that I will offer to my founder friends who may not know many other investors. I'm like, look, just pitch to me and I'll give you feedback. And yes, you need to be yourself, but you need to be your best self. I think that you want founders to be open, honest, and true to themselves in the pitch, but you're also presenting. Mm -hmm. You're also putting on a show. And if you think about you know, the best performers, maybe this is a weird analogy, but if you think about performers on stage, if you think about President Obama on stage, I think he exudes a sense of authenticity and connection, humility and vulnerability, but he's also on stage performing and Mm -hmm. he does a fantastic job. And yes, like towing that line is incredibly hard. And I'm giving you an example of one of the greatest orators of our time. But hopefully that's what all of us can strive to do, which is be yourself, but be your best self. I love that. (laughs) Be yourself, but be your best self. This has been super educational. Oh, thank you. Me too. For me too. Okay, good. good. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Threw some hard questions at me. I like it. That's my job. (laughs) Uh, I try to ask everyone this question. If if you could go back in time. Yeah. And meet a young Anargia Vardana uh-huh. who's just about to start venture. What advice would you give her? I am still a young Anargia Vardana oh. who is just starting <laughs> venture. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I have a lot of advice for myself. This is a job that never really turns off, mm. right? You are in meetings and at the office or at a founder's office or at a coffee shop, like you're just bouncing around all day. And then when I was a product manager, let's say I went to a friend's birthday party in the evening, I was done being a product manager. I was now at my friend's birthday party, Mm -hmm. but in venture you're at the birthday party. And especially as a consumer investor, you hear about some cool new trend or you find out that the friend's other friend is a founder and you start chatting. I mean, you are constantly on. And I feel incredibly blessed that I love what I do. And it's interesting to me to always be on. Like I want to hear about new consumer trends. I want to meet amazing new founders. It can be a little exhausting at times. So I would tell myself that it's an amazing job and anyone who does it is super lucky to do it, but it can be strenuous. It can be exhausting. And so prepare for doing some self-care, for really being able to shut down your brain, whether that's by working out or watching a movie or hanging out with friends who have nothing to do with tech. Mm. I have one of my best girlfriends is in med school and just, just talking about her med school experience is something so different and it's great and it's refreshing. And sometimes it inevitably turns into, wait, but what do you think about this health tech app? (laughs) But I try not to do that too much. Another thing I would tell myself is that like, It is all about the people. It is about the people you see every day. It's the people you may see once a year. It is about the relationships you build. And I think that for me aligns really well with my personal values because the number one thing I value in my life is my relationships. Mm -hmm. And that is the relationships with my family, with my husband, with my sister, with my friends, with my colleagues, with anybody. And I really, really, really value the relationships. And venture is very relationship driven which is great. It's also hard because relationships are with people and people are emotional and we own, we have our own emotions and it has its ups and downs. There are days where it can feel like amazing and everything's working. And then there's days where it can feel like nothing is working and everybody hates you. And it's so hard. And in those times, um, you know, I think it's just put your head down and keep working and keep looking for interesting opportunities, keep meeting great people, keep helping the people around you and hopefully good things will come your way. Anargia, thank you so much for joining us. This was a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Venture Confidential. Venture Confidential is brought to you by Heavybit. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out our library 
home to great educational talks by top investors, entrepreneurs, and other industry leaders. 